You know, Dustin, I was watching Friends and Seinfeld the other day, and you know, yeah, well, fun- not to cut you off, but because I don't do that to you very often, you shouldn't even be watching Friends or Seinfeld because you need to get you need to get woke, brother. What do you mean? You know, let me tell you something. Those two shows no, 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 are no, no, no. funny. Let me They're tell you, at- not to cut you off, but if you don't get woke, I don't know what this is going to be. You know, okay, not to cut you off. But, you know, this whole woke thing is undermining our country. It's undermining the West. It's Hmm. undermining everything. It's interesting because we have an author who is going to be joining us about that very problem. That's affecting everything, infiltrating it like a cancer. Yeah, cancer. Cancer. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Sons of History. I am Dustin Bass. And I am Alan Joaquin. That's right. And you really showed up dressed up today. This is fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to a uh, birthday party after this. So. Oh yeah? Yeah. Well, yeah. happy birthday. A friend, uh, friend to of mine. whoever. Robert Greenleaf. Robert Greenleaf. Yeah. What a name. What a that fantastic sounds like a woke, name. Yeah. Sounds like a woke name, doesn't well, it? Well, I was thinking of, sounds like an author's name. Actually, but... Um, should be like Roberto, probably yeah, would be more. It should be. Well, yeah. I'm um, looking forward to this conversation because I started out my career in journalism. We're talking to the deputy opinion editor of Newsweek, Batya Ungar Sargon, about her new book. And this is, I think this is going to be pretty cool. I think it's going to bring a lot of perspectives on the history of journalism and now the present horrid state of journalism of which... You and I and many of our fans are very acquainted with. Did you say news woke? Oh, we'll have to we'll said? have to poke her in the eye with that one, huh? Well, um, well I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I'm. Anything you know, else? Anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, they should call it news woke keem. <laughs> yeah, woke maybe you should start your own blog. That'd be great. You know, oh I wait, should. you don't do any writing, so. Um, you I have do write. I my job. My my. <laughs> 50-hour-a-week job. All right. Well, uh, before we get our guest on the show, I'm very excited about that. Let's do uh, what happened this week in history. Well, you know, uh, today we celebrate uh, President's Day. Mm -hmm. Or is it George Washington's birthday? Hmm. It's George Washington's birthday. That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. Let me tell you something. There are a lot of presidents that are not worth celebrating. Not to mention any names, but there's a certain, you know, person in <laughs> right now, you know. Not well, if it makes you feel any better, he has no idea that he is the president. Sure. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Someone's the president. Puppet. Hello. Puppet stay. Mm-hmm. You know. Actually, you know, I got to say that since 1988, I think we've had only one good president, in my opinion, since 88. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a long time, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, okay, so... George Washington's birthday. Okay, now, now this is going to be kind of confusing because, you know, I like to do confusing things. But, you know, February 22nd is supposed to be his birthday. But that's really not when he was born mm-hmm. because I know this is the confusing part. Okay, so he's listed as being born on February 22nd of 1732. But, like, his birth certificate and all that states February 11th of 1731. Okay, now why the confusion? Well, very simple. Um, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth in fifteen eighty two issued a papal bull that said that we are no longer using the Julian calendar. We are now going to use the Gregorian calendar, named after him. One little problem: there were a lot of countries that were not Catholic. Mm-hmm. That included Great Britain. Yeah, you know, Great Britain was Protestant. Yep. So they didn't follow the Gregorian calendar. They used the Julian calendar. And that's why a lot of the Orthodox churches still continued using the Julian calendar mm-hmm. and in the into the twentieth century. But in this case, so British North America was using the Julian calendar when when Washington was born. But in seventeen fifty two they started using the Gregorian calendar. So that was twenty one years after Washington was born, but now they mixed everything up, and Washington lost like a year and 11 days, so 
His birthday went from February the 11th of 1731 to February 22nd of 1732. Now, the whole year part, I don't understand, but, you know, that's... Yeah, so Washington's birthday was February 22nd, 1732, or February 11th. You know, and this is why the Mayflower thing, there was that whole confusion, Mm -hmm. because we were saying, okay, they landed on such and such date, but, nah, you know, they... Calendar says it was on another day, but uh, well, you've done a fantastic yeah. job of confusing me and everyone else, well, including George Washington. Well, okay, but celebrate George Washington's birthday, not President's Day, because yeah. boy, a lot of people don't deserve that uh, holiday. Exactly, absolutely. Um, and speaking of a man who is currently being undermined, the father of our country, George Washington. And speaking of undermining the country. February 21st, 1994 was a day that arrested a man who was definitely undermining the country. It was the 31-year CIA agent veteran or a 31-year veteran of the CIA, Aldrich Ames, was arrested on charges that he was spying for the Soviet Union. They said that he was spying I think from, yeah, 1985 to 1991. Just handing over, you know, material, uh, compromising FBI and CIA sources, uh, which ended up having a number of those sources killed. What happened to him? You know, last time I checked, you were supposed to get that that old hanging um, if you were caught for treason. Well, he got a life sentence without possibility of parole. I don't think they do that anymore. I think now you get a job as a CNN analyst. Oh, snap. Well done. Well played. Mm -hmm. Uh, Speaking of woke media. Um, So now if you want to uh, learn about what led up to his arrest, there was a good show. I think ABC or CBS did it. It was called The Assets. It's a pretty good show. Uh, It came out a few years ago. So you can check that out. And that is my This Week in History, Your Week in History, and... I hope we have a good week this week yeah, in so our too. current history. Yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we have our guest lined up. She is Bhatia Unger Sargon. She is the deputy opinion editor over at Newsweek, and she's the co-host of Newsweek's podcast, The Debate. She has written articles for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, and the New York Review of Books Daily, and she earned her PhD. I'm still working on mine. Um, I haven't really started my master's yet, but, you know, first things first. Got her PhD over at UC Berkeley. You know, if you believe that you have a PhD... I identify as a doctor. Yes, yes. yes. Then then you know what? You know better than me! I have to respect that, and I'm going to call you a doctor. Thank you. You know, I'm I'm a doctor, too. Doctor? Doctor. Doctor. All right. Doctor. All right. And doctor. All right, let's talk to the real doctor. Yeah, let's do that. All right, Bajia, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation. This is going to be fun stuff. Are you going to say something? Well, I want to flash the book. Flash I've been, it? You know, I've been reading this. It's a damn good book. You yeah, know? yeah. A lot of bad news in here. Yeah. A lot of bad news in here, ladies and gentlemen. If you want <laughs> if you want to meet the bear of bad news, she's right over there. So it's going to be... Uh, hopefully, hopefully, eventually, we'll run into some good news, right? Now, it's not as funny as the bad news bears, the original, but, you know... Yeah, it's but it's still some good humor in here. Yeah, there yeah. is, there is, there is. But, uh, yeah. but you know, Walter Matthau, come on, Walter Matthau, and then Billy Bob Thornton. I didn't no, see. It. I didn't, Actually, no, I didn't I watched, see either one. I watched the original one. Yeah, the one came out like in seventy six. Because you are original. And I was, that, you know, I, I was in the little league back in those days. Did you play baseball? Yes. I don't want to hear about it. All right, let's get on with the conversation, but yeah, um, okay, so. Your, your book, Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy, it is an accurate assessment, especially that um, the subtitle, because it's undermining people's ability to know precisely what is going on. And that's the whole idea of, of the media. My first question, early into your book, you are discussing sort of a brief history of journalism and the rise of newspapers. And then you mention that we, as journalists, need to get back to those roots. Why should that happen? 
So the argument I make in the book is that um, when you have power concentrated in the hand of a teeny tiny elite, um, that's no longer um, a democracy. That's an oligarchy. And I think that we're headed in that direction. Um, you know, obviously there are threats on the right, but the threats that I discuss are the threats from liberal and leftist media. Um, what I argue is that um, over the course of a generation, there was a status revolution among journalists to where journalists really became part of the elites. They used to be, it used to be a, a low status working class blue collar job. And today in order to become a journalist, you have to come from the elites. Um, and the elites today are part of, you know, what others have called a sort of meritocratic elite. Um, they've risen based on, you know, their intelligence, this like these fancy educations that they get, um, their talents, and they truly believe that people with that, you know, education should not only be at the top, should not only be, you know, you know, advising people how to do things, how to live their lives, but should actually have the largest share of power. They really believe that they should be controlling and running things. Um, and I argue that that's anti-democratic, that essentially as journalists, you know, became rich, became part of the elites, they abandoned the working class that they, you know, once belonged to. And today, what they do with that newfound power is to seek to uh, silence most working class Americans, including working class Americans of all races, by the way, they're not just trying to silence white working class people. It's, you know, anybody who's working class um, really has been deplatformed by this tiny liberal progressive leftist elite. And so I argue that that's a big threat to democracy and very destabilizing because the way they want it to be is that a tiny elite controls and runs everything and nobody else gets to have a say. And so why I want us to return to the older model is because, you know, a democracy is literally built on tolerance for viewpoints you disagree with. And what we have right now is, you know, 6% of the population are progressives. That's it. Just 6% of Americans are progressive. But the progressive worldview has a lock on all of the institutions that tell us, you know, what meaning, what how to, how to interpret our world, what the great American story is, you know, what is happening, right? Apart from Fox News, like the mainstream media by and large is sort of captured by this progressive agenda, this progressive worldview. But it's so not representative of where America America is at. And so I want us to get back to a place where our journalism reflects the American people who they actually are. You know, this kind of, I don't know if you watched the uh, Sex in the City or the recent one, but even friends of mine who are huge fans of that show are even saying that it's now gone crazy. So I saw a little bit of it, just a little bit. Too much city, not enough I, and it was, sex. Well, <laughs> So I actually think that the new sex in the city is um, a spoof on wokeness. Now, I may be like being too generous here, but to me, they were like the woke parts of the new show were like the punchlines. Like you were supposed to be laughing at them, not sympathizing with them. But that could be too generous. That could Did be totally too it? generous. Did you watch it? I didn't watch See, it. See, that's no, the hold thing. On, is... Hold on a well, second. Uh, let me uh, no, just... no, no, well, no, let me. no, no, okay, go ahead. no. I'm going to interrupt you this time. <laughs> he interrupted me earlier. The... Friends who actually watched the show were the ones who were complaining and they would post clips. Right. But what I'm saying is I think to an extent, we'll move on to well, they're your doing question. It. They're doing a bad part. They're doing a bad thing. Well, here's the thing. Yeah. In defense of non-wokeness, like, and sort of like the right sometimes gets so touchy because there's wokeness everywhere that it's sort of like McCarthyism. Like, yeah, there were communists. And there was a, a real problem. But then all of a sudden you started seeing communists everywhere, right? Well, now you're seeing wokeness everywhere. And I remember seeing a ton of articles about the new James Bond, right? And it was like, it's no good because it's woke. I went and watched it. And I'm like... But you said it wasn't that great. I'm like, it's not woke. It's just not a good movie. It's just <laughs> not a good James Bond movie. Like, right. it, wasn't, it wasn't good. But don't put it off on woke. And that's the thing is like, now you're creating something that's not there. Like, stick to what's there. And I don't know. I haven't seen Sex and the City. I didn't watch the show. I really have no interest. Um, but I did watch James Bond, and I, I would just see that. I'm like, no, don't make it into something that it's actually not. Right. Because you know, I, I saw Kim Cattrall in Australia, so, you know. that. What did y'all do? I said hey to her, and I told, said I wanted to take a picture of her. So, she, yeah, she let me. Yeah? Yeah. There you go. So my, my one 
thing with Sex and the City. All right, now to the questions. So, okay, now in a 19, I, and I remember watching this in the 1988 presidential debate, Bernie Shaw asked Michael Dukakis, who was a death penalty opponent, you know, what would he do if somebody murdered and raped his uh, wife, Kitty? And, um, you know, and he was severely criticized for it, even though Dukakis said, hey, look, it was a fair question. And I thought it was a fair question. So, you know, that was in 88. Now let's fast forward to 2012. Um, and there's the presidential debate uh, between Romney and Obama. And moderator Candy Crowley jumped into the debate and sided with Obama over a dispute regarding terrorism in, in what happened in uh, Benghazi. Um, now, when she jumped in, it clearly rattled Romney, and I thought it totally changed. I thought the, the election was over at that point. Um, but but uh, Crowley later said that she made a mistake, that Romney was right, but his wording wasn't correct. Now, let's move up to 2020. And there was supposed to be a second presidential debate, but instead of that, it ended up being uh, you had George Stephanopoulos, who was timidly, timidly interviewing Joe Biden, while at the same time you had uh, Savannah Guthrie, who was just slamming Donald Trump left and right. Now, the media during that time, you know, they refused to discuss Hunter Biden's laptop or his behavior. They refused to talk about Joe Biden and what he did in the Ukraine. And if, uh, if Facebook, if anyone on Facebook or Twitter discussed it, like uh, the New York Post, they would shut them down and close their account. So my question, which I know is a long one, is... <laughs> in a roundabout covering 30 years. Go ahead. Well, well, you know, do you think that, you know, the media, will they, are they going to undermine all future elections? Um, you know, are they going to determine our nation's economy, um, our, our schools, our, our, all our information and our future in general? It's a great question. Um, I think the answer is no. I think you can look at, um, for example, the Virginia election, uh, you know, where Glenn Youngkin won, right, despite being smeared as a white supremacist, essentially by the media left and right, the voters knew better. And, you know, I, I was very skeptical of the Russiagate narrative from the beginning, because, you know, the media was making a leap, you know, obviously, it's true that Russia has troll farms, and that those troll farms, it has been substantiated, created memes, you know, to the benefit of, you know, Hillary Clinton, right, uh, to, to, um, and to the benefit of Donald Trump, right? Th th those memes existed, right? Now, but that to, to suggest to go from there, yes, Russia had troll farms creating pro Donald Trump memes, right? That's not what they reported. What they reported was Russia through the election with those memes. In order to get from they had troll farms creating memes to they threw the election, you have to prove that people changed their minds based on those memes. And that evidence just doesn't exist. And the reason it doesn't exist is because Americans aren't morons, right? Nobody changed their mind about who to vote for based on a meme that said Jesus is endorsing Donald Trump, right? You have to have so much contempt for your political opponents to think that those memes changed people's minds and 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 through the election and i think the same thing is true on the on the left yes the media is completely in the bag for the progressives they're completely in the bag for the for the democrats at this point it's very very clear 91% of new york times readers are democrats right now you know you have to work really hard to get there as the paper of record right to lose like so many republican readers um you know so i think it's very clear that they very much didn't want donald trump to win again very much on the side of Joe Biden and are in general, like very clearly partisan at this point. At the same time, I just think the American people are smarter than that. And I think you're seeing that in election after election. It wasn't just Glenn Youngkin. It was um, Eric Adams winning the mayoralty of New York, right? Despite the fact that the media was like completely on the side of the progressives, right? You know, so, so I, I think that we need to have, you know, more respect for our fellow Americans. Like they know the problem with the media right now is that it is just so disconnected from where the average American is at, that it just does not matter, I don't think, what they say. And I think that's why they're so angry and so crazy right now is because they realized that they are losing whatever influence they had by trying to tell Americans 
what to think instead of telling them what's happening. I mean, they've lost the mission and in trying to tell them what to think from their, you know, rich, you know, like, like incredibly expensive neighborhoods where they don't encounter any working class people ever and have no idea what their concerns are, you know, it's just falling flat, right? Like there, you know, I don't know any journalists out there who are actually feeling inflation in a way that is actually hurting them. But that's like one of the number one issues that Americans are dealing with today. You know, how am I going to pay for groceries? How am I going to pay for the gas at the gas pump, right? Americans know that these people they see on CNN and read in the New York Times are rich and that they have no idea what their lives are like. And so I think I, 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 I agree with your assessment. I think that that litany of showing the media sort of over time getting into the bag of the Democrat, totally agree with that assessment. But whether it's an actual threat, I don't think so, because I think Americans are too smart for that. OK, um, <clears throat> you mentioned in your book several times um, you mentioned Trump, Donald Trump, and, and obviously right, rightly so. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned is the time that he called the media, the enemy of the people. Now the media is considered the fourth estate. It's supposed to be the watchdog for the people. Um, but the media, as you write very well in your book is centered now around political ideology and ideology that is typically, and you also mentioned in your book, uh, counter to American traditional values. Along with that, they don't cover certain topics, as Alan mentioned a moment ago, or they, as you mentioned often in your new book, stir the pot about race and gender, which only agitates readers and leads to more dissension and sometimes even violence. Given what journalism and the media has become, was Trump right? Has the media become the enemy of the people? Even if they, even if, as you mentioned a second ago, the influence is not there like we may think it is, are they still an enemy of the people? I wouldn't use the word enemy. Um, it's a little bit too strong for me. They, their interests are at cross purposes with the interests of working class Americans and middle class Americans because they're in the elites and they're part of power. So it used to be that journalists were working class guys. They were the little guy. They lived next door to factory men and line men and they made maybe a little bit more money than them, but they were embedded in working class neighborhoods and they would get access to people in power because they were journalists. And what they did with that access was demand justice on behalf of the little guy. That's how they saw their job is to, to be like breaking down the doors of power and demanding justice on behalf of the little guy. Today, journalists are power. They go to school with the with with billionaires. They go to these fancy schools with um, and their children go to school with the children of billionaires and the children of politicians. You know, so when they come up, they're coming up with people they went to school with. With they're in power right now, and so they are threatened by anything that threatens that power. You see this over and over again. You know, in in their coverage of things. So now, instead of being the little guy representing the little guy demanding justice on behalf of the people of power, they are in power defending politics politicians and silencing the little guy from having any kind of dissent or objections. Like you really saw this with the truckers convoy. I mean, that the, the freedom convoy, that's been the media's, you know, smear them as fascists from day one and then cheer on the actual fascist measures brought in to silence them. And um, so I would say, I think enemy is too strong a word, but I think Trump was vindicated about so many of the things that, you know, it was like, I, even I thought I was like, oh, that's clearly a conspiracy theory. And then it would like turn out out that it was true, you know? I mean, uh, so I think he was vindicated in being um, very explicit about how he was being treated, which was like bad, bad journalism, wrong, unfair. But I think to say enemy of the people, I mean, to me, I would just like, I, that's a bit too harsh for me. What do you think? Do you think that that's like an act, uh, like a, do, do you, do you accept that? I, I don't know. I'm on the fence about it. I, to me, I would say it's like a little bit too strong. It's like maybe a little bit, what do you think? I yes. want to say they are, and here's why. Because, you know, the very title of your book says undermining democracy. Mm -hmm. They're undermining our country. Yeah, they are yeah. the enemy of the people. I if would say also, I would say yes, because let's say that you and I are friends, right? Or you think I'm your friend. And then you come to find out for the years, I've every time we've had a conversation, I'm lying to you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not even telling you the truth. And it, and now you have gone and like destroyed maybe relationships or you've done some things that you wouldn't have done if I'd been telling you the truth. 
if the media is constantly lying to the American people about the most important things that they should know about, something as simple as inflation is not good and trying to spin it as, oh no, this inflation is actually a good thing. Like you are not, if you're not the friend of the people, you're not the advocate of the people and you're definitely not neutral, then you must be something else. And the only thing that I see left is you are the enemy of the people because you're not helping, you're hindering. I'll give, I'll let me, let me just float this. So a lot of what I think is happening is overcorrection, to, but some of the things I think are important, like, okay, I'll give you an example, like George Floyd, right? I think if, if that hadn't been filmed and if we, if we weren't in the grip of woke media, which I think is bad, I also am not sure that George Floyd's killer would be in jail. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about that. I feel like he was murdered. I feel I watched the whole trial and I felt like the evidence was really clear. But I think if that had not been a national story and if that video had not gone totally viral and he, that his kill, Derek Chauvin wouldn't be in prison. And I think it's really important for America that 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 Derek Chauvin is in prison. So to me, it's like, yeah, we're overcorrecting. There, we're, we're in the grip of a moral panic about race and gender. The working class has been silenced, but I think a lot of that stems from like a genuine desire at some level to do good that's gone awry. It's very much gone awry, but like the, I still feel like there are certain, like it, that that is an example of something that's like very important to me. And yeah, what do you think? But with that, yeah. who filmed the George Floyd incident? It wasn't the media. It was people. It was on social media. It went viral because it was a terrible act and it was picked up by the media. And then it started this, this brush fire, right. but it was the people who were like videoing it right. in an instant that traumatized like a ton of people. It really bothered me. So, I mean, one, he died. That was terrible, but it also brought to the front. You and I have discussed that. Like, it brought to the forefront that you are absolutely defenseless when it comes to dealing with the police. Which is one of those things. Like, it's like, oh well, if the police are supposed to protect you and they're not, then what do they become? And then you start asking the same questions we asked a moment ago, right? So you have to look at that. So the illustration of George Floyd, I don't really agree with because it wasn't journalists. It was regular people that did all that they could, which was video. Right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to mention also um, you had some you said something about influencing the election, that it didn't influence the election. Now, I, I did read in, in some news articles that had the people known some of the things that Hunter Biden did that yeah. would have, that would have swayed their vote number one, um, but in terms of what we're discussing right now, I here's why I also think that the media is the enemy of the people is, you know we we had I grew up in a predominantly white I, I went to a predominantly white school and you know we had we had a couple of black kids in our class not that many but we had a couple and one of them ended up becoming the president of the student body. He was elected president of the student body, and every every black uh, boy that I knew, they they were all considered cool, but yet because of the way the media portrayed things, they felt like that they were victims, or that they felt that they were on the defensive, or that nobody liked them, which which couldn't have been further from the truth. And now, when I just yesterday I was reading the news, and I see this a lot. Uh, somewhere in New York, there was a, a white coach that threw a black kid up against a wall. But the headline was, white coach throws black teen against the wall. That was the headline. Now, in Pittsburgh, there was a white female Uber driver that was murdered by a black man, but that wasn't the headline. And you had to... It, the, the race wasn't even mentioned. N nowhere was it mentioned. I had to Google the guy to see what he looked like before I finally saw that it was a black guy. So... Now, I'm not sitting here saying make it a racial thing with what happened in Pittsburgh, but I am kind of bothered by what I'm seeing where in New York you had the headline being white guy 
beats up black kid and and that's always the case and and so I, I think that they're inflaming hatred between the races when you know yeah. you you go around to bars you go around at work nobody cares anymore yeah it's true I'm, i mean seriously so i would i so i um I'm going to totally agree with you and then bring one counter example though. So the, I, I completely agree with you, like to people who live in the North, like who live in New York, when they go to the South and they walk into a bar and it's just, you know, half white, half black, everybody's like kind of living in harmony, like race is like just not the same thing that it is up here. There's always like a lot of shock. I know I had that when I started reporting in the South, I've heard this from other people, like in the north which is extremely segregated so like new york city is deeply deeply segregated new york city's public schools are more segregated than alabama's like up here woke media has made race this massive thing i argue in the book because of class because journalists have become you know part of the elites and it's this great distraction from a class divide that they're benefiting from um so yes they do that you know for a combination of like personal reasons but also the business model is now based on like outrage and things you know, the two things that make white affluent liberals very outraged are the words Donald Trump and white supremacy, right? So like, yes, it's all about like, you know, the Benjamins, okay? So I agree with you completely about that. And it's, you know, Americans thought race relations were better 20 years ago than they do now. Like Americans of all races thought race relations were better when they were asked about it in the 90s than they do now. And that's a travesty. Like we've reintroduced race to the forefront of people's consciousness. And that's terrible. We're, we're going, we're back sliding. I mean, Dr. King would be horrified, I believe. At the same time, I saw a video the other day and it was of a black kid and a white kid who got into an altercation at a mall. And the white kid was much bigger and clearly started the altercation. Like, and they, you know, he sort of threw the first punch. They started punching. The police showed up. They instantly separated them. They let the white kid just sit there and then they, immediately threw the black kid to the ground and put him in handcuffs. And, you know, they didn't shoot him. There's no evidence that actually suggests that the police shoot black men more than they shoot white men. There is evidence to suggest that they shoot poor people more than rich people. But once you control for money, there's the racial gap disappears. But there is evidence that they insult black people more. They lay hands on them more. They uh, put them in handcuffs more. They throw them up against cars more and they pull them over more. So like we, the, the problem with the media is like, we actually do have a problem with um, you, I, the data is all in the book on that. So I really triple check that. Yeah. So um, um, uh, but but please feel free to fact check me um, live as well. But um, so that, you know, we have a problem with policing and, and, and black men that that exists, black people. What we don't have is a problem of a genocide against black people. Black men are not being killed more than white men. But so when you look at what the media does, they don't say, look, we have this problem. It's a very specific problem, like a black person who calls the police when they need them are 50% more likely to be insulted than a white person. Like to me, that is a moral travesty. Like already there, let's just sit with that. Let's figure this out, you know, but no, instead they say there's a genocide against black men. They, 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 um, they, they're constantly harping on this, on the shootings, which are not disproportionate against black men instead of all the things that aren't. And that's the problem. Instead of saying we have a problem with the between the police and, and black communities, there's one specific problem. They say America is a white supremacy, which is false, right? Which is not true, right? That America doesn't have a problem with how it treats Asians or Jews, you know, by and large, or Latinos by and large. Like it's we have one problem left that we're not dealing with. And instead of dealing with that, they say, oh, it's it's racist to want to have a border. It's racist to not want an unlimited amount of immigrants, the mission creep, you know, away from the actual problem towards this like generalized America's white supremacy, whiteness is evil. That is all about class. It's all about protecting the interests of an upper crust by distracting from the ways in which inequality has benefited from them and allowing them to act like they are the good guys when they're the ones benefiting from the class divide. Well, now, about 20 years ago, uh, Bernie Sanders, who was a um, former, or he was a CBS correspondent, I think, when his book Bias came out, um, he, he, he really was kind of uh, warning everybody. You said Bernie uh, Sanders. You mean Bernie what I, Goldberg. What did I say? Bernie Sanders? Bernie Sanders. I'm sorry, Bernie Goldberg. I was wondering, I'm like, was Bernie Sanders? I know. I was like, Bernie wrote a book called Bias. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, it's the same name. It's the it's same religion. So there you go. 
Oh, beautiful. I think, yeah, I guess they're the same. I don't know. But anyway, all right. So Bernie Goldberg, excuse me. I uh, hope that I'm not going to be canceled by a certain... <laughs> Bernie Goldberg wrote a book. Uh, he was a CBS correspondent. It was kind of a, you know, a, it was a warning. Uh, he sounded the alarm on bias, arrogance, and elitism that has now morphed into wokeism. Um, now... It was barely a bump in the road. It it made a little bit of headlines and then it it it, it went away. Um, and frankly, uh, you know, nothing really has changed. Now, if you look at what's going on in Canada, Australia, Germany, France, you have these, you know, these Western nations, and not only them, but some of the some of our states like Michigan, California, New York, that are taking extreme measures um, to fight and to combat uh, COVID that I think would have horrified most people 20 or 30 years ago. Um, now, I remember this. Although it wasn't as harsh, I do remember when the uh, Polish government cracked down on solidarity uh, in December of 1981. Now, you know, not as harsh, but it does remind me very much of it. Um, but the media right now, I mean, they go along with these measures. They're not, they're not criticizing. They're not asking tough questions such as, you know, what are the origins of the virus? You know, questions that they should be asking. Um, and, you know, anyone who criticizes Red China is labeled a racist. So my question is, is do you think that your book is going to make more of an impact than Bernie Goldberg's books? Or Bernie Sanders. Um, well, I don't know. Bernie Sanders did run for president, could have won oh, the, yeah, the new nomination. Oh, yeah, the Modern Revolution or something like that, yeah. Um, no, I, I don't think my book's going to have a bigger impact. I, I'm despairing. I'm in a moment of despair, like uh, over the coverage of the truckers convoy, the freedom convoy. And um, anyone who criticizes the elitism immediately gets called a conservative so that the liberals don't have to listen to them. So I don't feel hopeful that my book will have a bigger impact. No. Hmm. Well, I hope it does. But, but you know it's funny <laughs> it's you. funny that you that say that right there is bad news <laughs> what? you know maybe by you being on this show uh, yes to the top. i know bernie goldberg was on uh, you know bill o'reilly's show all the time but uh yeah. you know this could be different yeah. this could be a new beginning for you yeah and you you did <laughs> yeah you did get on tucker so yeah. that was that's you know, that's a big audience, yeah. but at the same time, it's conservative. And so, yeah, I understand, yeah. like, you're wanting it to get over into the other camp. No, I'm, you know what, like, you know, t the thing about Tucker's show is he's the only one who talks about class in, in all the mainstream media. And you can tell he's very angry about a lot of the same things I'm very angry about. But when he articulates so well what they're doing like the hypocrisy my anger turns into like relief just at hearing somebody say it and so if my book is only read by working class conservatives who suddenly finally understand the hypocrisy of the people who hate them and have contempt for them and act like they're the holier than thou ones if it only gives a voice to those people i will be very very happy and very satisfied you know if i like if it gives one person comfort i will be and it has. I mean, I hear from working class people all the time, including black people and, you know, who just are like, my God, thank God somebody finally said it. You know, I so I feel like, yeah, it's giving comfort to the right people and it's, you know, making the right people angry. But it's it is like they're the um, defense mechanisms on the left in this elite are very, very strong right now because the threat to their position, to their privilege is is very big and very, I think, becoming more and more obvious. So there's a lot of resistance, I think, to hearing this message. Like, it's insane. If, can you imagine telling Marx, like going back in time and saying to Marx, anyone who brings up your critique, which is what I'm doing, like I'm a Marxian, I think it's like a class analysis, right? Like, and you, can you imagine going to Marx and saying, anyone who makes your critique is going to be branded, not just a conservative, but a white supremacist, like what, how he would have responded? <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Well, he was German, like nine. He was. <laughs> she is so easy. Like it's a, it's a hot crowd, uh, hot crowd. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we should end the show right now. Isn't that what Costanza said? We should on a high note. <laughs> yeah, you should walk out. 
We need to get you here more often. <laughs> I know. Like this. Yeah. All right. It's all. Yeah. Never mind. Go ahead. Well, you ready? <laughs> Waiting for her to catch her breath. <laughs> all right. Now, Rush Limbaugh and Bill O'Reilly. You know, they uh, they told their informed their listeners uh, and their viewers that uh, you know not everyone thought like Norman Lear did or the um, you know the. the Always, it was three to one or four to one liberal versus conservative um, ratio panels on The View or This Week with Sam and Cokie. So, um, now not, you know, not to be, you know, not happy with the loss of the monopoly that they once had, the elite opponents tried to shut down these people, Limbaugh and, and O'Reilly, and, you know, successfully did with, uh, with O'Reilly. But see, now we have... Joe Rogan, who's a former Bernie Sanders supporter, and you have the uh, libertine uh, Bill Maher. Now they are speaking out against wokeism, and they're now being—they're now the targets of the elite. You have Seinfeld and Friends, and I know we mentioned that earlier. He and I did. Uh, Seinfeld and Friends are under fire. Uh, Roseanne Barr, you know, she's done. Uh, Arthur, authors like Laura Ingram, Laura Ingalls Wilder, Dr. Seuss. You have Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, history, math, being on time. They're all on the chopping block. How's this going to end? Being on time. I like that. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> Work ethic, being on time, right. having goals in your life, all on the chopping block. Yeah. Oh, wanting to raise a nuclear family. Yeah, that's right. You know got to go that that's got to go because it's yeah i mean how do you think this will end Batya? i think we're in the woke clash i think people are i think it's very clear that the people who claim to speak on behalf of the black community have no idea what conversations within the black community sound like and i, I think it's becoming increasingly clear i think every person of color who votes for the republicans um makes it clearer what i want to see is republicans going into these communities where people have been marginalized and offering them the things that will make their lives better, like safe streets, you know, maybe better schools, whether that's through school choice or, you know, whatever it is. Like I, the thing that like, yeah, it's very obvious, I think to a lot of people that the woke agenda has abandoned the black community, but it's not clear to me that Republicans are going to pick up that slack. Like I, I think that they, what I want to see is Republicans committing to two or three cycles of losing but like showing up and making a presence in the black community and saying, we're, we have your best interests at heart and we're going to be here for you and we're going to give you a choice. And I'll just add, like on the subject of a choice, I'll just add to your list of cancellations. You know, John Stewart went on Crossfire and essentially mocked Tucker Carlson so much that they actually ended up canceling the show, which used to be this debate show on CNN. And CNN now never has conservatives on, never has Republicans on. And he mocked them because it was not like, I guess, highbrow enough for him. Like it was actually a show that was pitched at people without a college degree. It was pitched at people who don't have the time to sit around like Jon Stewart spending all day learning the intricacies of everything. It was very like, clear cut. Yeah, it was very brawly, whatever. But like, you know, th that is exactly what I'm talking about is you have basically a person from this upper crust, right, sneering at how people who are not as highly educated as he is would um, have access to a debate scenario, right? That was pitched at them. And he said, oh, this isn't highbrow enough for me, made fun of it. And then they literally canceled the show. And now there's no debate happening in liberal media. And the point that I always make is like, the point of a debate is not to win. It's not to convince people of your point of view. It's to give them a choice which is literally what freedom is about, is literally what democracy is about. It's literally what liberalism is about, is saying there's a choice. There's pro-life and, and pro-choice, right? And, and there's two options and you decide what's best for you, right? That no longer exists on the left, right? That's considered white supremacy on the left, right? Like, why would you give anybody a platform who doesn't agree with you? And they don't understand how much they've weakened their position by doing that because it makes everybody realize that they're just afraid to engage engage honestly in debate. So I think we're, where do we go from here? I think we're in the woke clash. I think we're in the beginning of the boat turning around and I want to see 
Republicans showing up. I know they care about criminal justice reform. I know they care about safe streets and I know they care about police reform. I want them to show up in the black community and make the case for themselves and why they are going to represent these interests. And like, it's not even that I want black people to be Republicans. It's that I want people to have to fight for their votes so that they actually get the things that they need. Yeah. You know, she didn't agree with us on everything, so I think we need to erase this tape. Yeah, no, we're not even going to post this. Can't yeah, yeah, you know what? Yeah, uh, this oh, yeah. is. Yeah, we're not going to post this. Shame. Nine. 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 <laughs> Nine. Uh, listen, okay. I, uh, I, om- I dropped my book, and therefore, um, Boy, the indi- I'm going to recommend this book. This is a very, and I'm going to recommend you. I hope, you know, I hope uh, we bring her back on the show. And she just needs to write another book. Or, okay. Yeah. Or s- I'll get right on that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or send us uh, send something, um, one of your articles that you think are like, oh, I think this would be really cool. So, yeah. We'll do. We'll do. Thank you guys so much. This was so fun. Hey, we've we've thoroughly enjoyed having you. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, it is Batia Unger Sargon. She is the author of Bad News, How Woke Media is Undermining Democracy. I think you made your case pretty clear um, just in what we've said, but this book does such an incredible job of diving into just, I guess, the, the details, the nitty gritty of what the problem is and how, like, the elites have taken over journalism and now you have what we have right now, which is a, an institution that is supposed to represent the working class people and is not whether they are the enemy Mm -hmm. remains to be seen. We don't know. Look, we're not calling you the enemy. We're definitely not calling our friends over the Epic times, the enemy, because he and I write for them, do op-ed pieces. And, you know, I do a show now with them. Um, you watch that? But, yeah. but you know, but if they're gonna sit there and say capitalism bad, socialism good, and and uh, you know divide the people, and, and you make ultimately the people, know what it leads to, it's yeah, yeah, Who yeah. Knows? Then then yeah, you know, I listen. I'm I'm all for people having differing views. You know, one of the reasons why I like Bill Maher, I don't care for half the things that he says, but damn, you know, we we need to defend his right to to speak. We need to defend Whoopi Goldberg, even though she doesn't deserve it. Whoopi Goldberg she should in, not have been punished for two weeks for making a statement. Okay, she was in Sister Act. Come on, yeah, well, yeah you yeah. know what? I liked her in Ghost, actually. I Ghost, yeah, she, she was, was good in Ghost. She was good. All right, well, she is a friend of the people, ladies and gentlemen. That's <laughs> Bantia. Uh, thanks again for being on the Sons of History. Greatly appreciate it. Love the book. Um, I will probably send it back to you if you can sign it and then send it back to me. I'd greatly appreciate it. So, oh yeah, do mine too. No, I'm not paying for that. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so much, you guys. This was really fun. Thank you. We enjoyed it. All right, man. Thoughts on the interview? Yeah, hey, you did good. She was a uh, class act and uh, funny and uh, fun to talk to, and and uh, she seems to know what she's talking about. Yeah, she's really good. Um, mm. And yeah, very funny. Very easy to. Very easy to talk to. I objected to her not agreeing on me 100% of the time, so, so that's why I think we need to... Uh, so maybe we should just you know, cancel this whole interview and yeah. delete... You know, the, delete what? I don't know. Nah, <laughs> what can I say? You're so, I enjoyed you're so it. against cancel culture. Uh, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, that was a great interview. Yeah. Um, book and movie recommendations? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I think uh, I think we both are gonna agree that yep. this is the book to get. This is a damn good book, yeah. um, chock full of information. And you know, I hope that uh, she's more successful than Bernie Goldberg and Bernie Sanders. Yeah, well, you know, if she ran for president, I'd vote for her. Well, it's crazy, you know? man. You know, Twitter did a or no, it was um, I think it was people over at MIT. I think they did they did a study. This was a few years ago. And they were saying that lies are seven times more, um, well, they, they spread seven times faster than the truth, which yeah. is why, you know, one of the reasons why Bernie Sanders does so well, 
is because he freaking lies about so many different things, especially uh, that socialism is good. And so somehow he has, you know, his stuff like spreads like wildfire. AOC, you know, well, almost politicians in general. But it's like you're you're lying and you know you're lying. And yet, obviously, it, it continues to spread like wildfire. And yeah, I've, I've seen, I mean, there, there's some things where somebody will say something and and oppose, you know, someone on the opposition will say, well, this person said blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it'll be proven that that person didn't say it, yeah. but they'll continue to say, well, they'll he... continue to say yeah. it, yeah. And, they'll, I mean, and they're not called. And you know what? In people Facebook, are just now knowing that the whole Russia collusion thing, uh-huh. and like, they're just now saying, like, oh, the Clinton campaign had something to do with it? Like, well, where they're not even the talking about it. No, Yeah, no. they're not even talking about it on no, the news. Hardly. You know? It's a joke. But yeah, so, there was yeah. a couple of people I had, I mean, hated debates on. They kept saying, he did it and you know it. And I'm like, um, you know, see, I told you so, idiot. You know, Such a I told them show. that, well, that yeah. was... Uh, like, how many times you had to get proven wrong? Anyways, all right, that's our book recommendation. Fantastic yeah. book. Yeah, please, bad news. Please read it and also buy, maybe buy a few copies um, and then give it to especially some of your younger kids like teens and college age students they need to read this book i I just they really do uh movie recommendation my movie recommendation i had mentioned it to her earlier uh before we started recording uh there was a 2003 film called shattered glass it was about this guy by the name of stephen glass he was a young uh reporter for the new republic and Come to find out, I mean, he was, speaking of spreading like wildfire, I mean, he was just dominating, right? His his work was dominating, uh, major influence. Come to find out, uh, he was lying and fabricating and coming up sometimes completely with just fabricated stories and writing about them, coming up with fake sources. Um, And then one of his stories... Uh, Forbes actually called him out on one of his stories, and then that's where the dominoes fell. And come to find out, he had fabricated a ton of different different things. Uh, really good film. Actually, you can watch it for free on YouTube uh, if you wanted to. But that, to an extent, I believe, is where journalism is today, except people aren't holding them to the fire. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, you have an anonymous, an anonymous source? Yes, I do. And what did they say? They said that uh, blah, blah, blah. And it could be just the most wild thing. Like, okay, that's fine. Not going to check to see if that anonymous source is reliable or if it's even a real person. So it's a, it's become, the more you see anonymous source, the more you should be suspicious. Hmm. Yeah, I, I I agree with you on that one. So, and I, believe me, I've seen a lot of uh, journalists. I held Brian Williams. Look what happened to that yeah. guy. You know, yeah. even, and, you know. But look at him. Yeah. Now he's. Had, he's been heading up MSNBC, getting paid God knows what. Yeah. Well, he retired recently. Uh, but, uh, but you know, even uh, that, that news program, it, it was NBC's version of 2020, which I can't remember. Dateline? Dateline, Dateline or whatever. Oh, Dateline? Yeah, I think okay. it's called Dateline NBC or something like that. Mm-hmm. They fabricated a story about, um, like, GMC trucks blowing up. And they, they used rockets. They were busted for using rockets to create explosions. So, yeah, rockets. I mean, I was like, how the hell do you use a rocket? And But they, you know, Dateline should have been shut down, and yeah, they weren't. But they weren't. No, they no. kept going. So, all right. Uh, speaking of fantasy, uh, my movie recommendation is actually a TV series. Battlestar Galactica. That's right. Now, you can get the Blu-ray, like the, you know, the sp- pack that has everything and it has all four seasons not only does it have all four seasons but it has caprica it has the original 1978 seasons with lauren green um no one knows who that is lauren green he no he did those alpo commercials what bonanza no. remember bonanza you're too young bonanza was like a big show but I but in 1978 bonanza. he did he did uh battlestar galactica which i thought was pretty good back in those days but then i think it was either 2003 or 2004 they had a brand new they they they, they did a reboot of battlestar galactica it had edward james uh, almost as the uh you're you okay. liked him from but the you know 
Uh, it was it was a damn good believe, movie. I cannot believe you're even bringing this, dude. Here. It was well, a good. Hold on, me, hold on. The miniseries I thought was wow. This is some good stuff. And then they followed it up with four seasons. They had three movies, and then they had another uh, prequel. Yeah, you know, but Beautiful. yeah, it's it's a good good television show. And like I said, you can get the ultimate pack. It's you know maybe about 130 bucks, but you know Blu-ray. But it is worth it. Yeah, I'm watching them right you now. You and I would not have been friends in high school, actually. I, we're not <laughs> friends now. That's true. <laughs> hey man, well I will say this: Batia beats Battlestar Galactica, and you have no idea what that reference is from. That's from an actually a good show called The Office. Go watch that. Mm. Which I'm surprised you've never watched that because you work I, in a similar. I watched uh, the original situation. British version with that comedian that uh, Ricky Gervais, Gervais. Yeah, the one who torched the um, Golden Globes. The Golden Globes. Yeah. So I, I used to. That's a how you of know mine. we're friends. Is I finish all your sentences. Yes. That's you know that's weird because you know they always say find someone who can finish your sentences. Sentences. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are an. Uh, Idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I nailed it. All right. Where can people find us? Let's get out of here. All right. They can find us on Facebook. They can find us on Instagram. And go to YouTube and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. And like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. Now, if we ever get shadow banned or banned altogether, we have... Oh, are, are, are we starting on Rumble now? Or? Yeah, we started on Rumble a while back, but I haven't okay. uploaded in a long time, so i got to catch up on that. Go ahead. Okay, all right. But we do have our very own website mm-hmm. that you can even buy products from. It's www.thesonsofhistory.com. Beautiful. All right. That's all. Go buy the book and go watch Battlestar Galactica. Mm-hmm.